Coming up, learning loss. New national test scores are out for math and reading, and the grades are not good. We have details coming up. And we'll also visit one school that's changing things up to help students get higher marks. Then why do leaves change colors in the fall? We've got the answers ahead. Also, trick or treat. Tips for a fun and spooky Halloween. Plus, I have a question. What's the history of trick or treating? Hi, my name is Grayson. We love that we use kids edition. Our question is, are witches real? We'll answer those questions and more as we take a look at the history behind Halloween. And growing the family business, this 12-year-old turned his love of farming into a way to help feed his community. I think it's really important for people to know where your food comes from. I really encourage people to grow their own food and see how it all happens. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I had a great time as usual working from our Los Angeles studios last week, but it's always great to be back at our home base in New York City. We have a super lineup ahead, including our picture of the week. Plus, it's the Great Pumpkin. We'll tell you how one teacher grew this gigantic pumpkin. And Halloween is just a few days away, so grab your costumes, because we're getting into the Halloween spirit this week with a couple of fun segments, including a look at how Halloween got started. And by the way, I'll be revealing my costume in just a few moments. But first, straight to the news. And one of the big stories affecting you guys, learning. This year, with the support of our sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, we are highlighting education stories across the country. And a new report out now shows the pandemic is still, believe it or not, having a big impact on students. Nearly three years later, however, there are signs of a turnaround in one school district. Details now from our good friend, Rahima Ellis. In this New Jersey school district, these fourth graders are excited to be back in the classroom. Then you are going to show me. During the pandemic, there was a lot of learning remotely, wasn't there? Yes. Did you like that? No. Nobody likes remote learning? No. That feeling seems to be a popular one among some kids. Many students suffered learning loss as a result of COVID-19 and now the nation's report card is out with new test results since the pandemic began and the grades are not good. The National Assessment of Educational Progress tested nearly 450,000 fourth and eighth graders across the country. The math results were especially alarming with the steepest declines ever recorded. Just 26% of eighth graders were proficient or above in math down from 34% in 2019. The average eighth grade math score fell in every state except Utah. In reading, only 33% of fourth graders were proficient or above, down from 35%. In Union, New Jersey, Superintendent Scott Taylor is keenly aware of the problem. Have the challenges ever been greater than now? No, no, the challenges are greater than uh, I've experienced in any year of my 30-year career. What are they doing about it? In the classroom, teachers here focus on small group instruction, closely track each student's progress throughout the year, and the kids also spend time relearning social skills necessary to improve their academics. In our case, we implement the morning meeting, which helps children um, kind of be a part of a classroom community where they feel accepted, um, where we celebrate the individuality of each student, and where they feel that their personal lives are a priority. And it's not just all academics. And so I think having that meeting in the morning kind of sets the tone and it sets the children up for success, not only throughout the day, but in the future. What's the best thing about being back in the classroom in school? Because you get in-person learning and you get to like see your friends and stuff like that. Zoe, what's the best thing about being back in person in school? You can understand more and there's no glitches like an online school. Joelle? Um, the best part about um, school is because you get face-to-face -face learning. You get to talk to your friends and you get to like, socialize and all that. It's also very In rebuilding those social skills, fourth grade teacher Cynthia Carhart sees the benefits in the classroom. You can't expect a child to grow three grade levels in one year, 
But as long as they're making growth and they're showing you that they're trying, that's really important. I learned more seeing my teacher face to face because like I could focus. The superintendent says it's too soon to tell whether they're making progress, but they are seeing some positive signs. We are seeing some uptick in academic performance, albeit very incremental, but more importantly, we're seeing kids be happier, talk with each other more constructively, our behavior problems have gone down. All of that gives me a lot of hope. All right, Rahima, thanks so much for that. Well, one of the hallmarks of the fall season is seeing the leaves change colors. And two viewers from Pennsylvania, where I bet the trees are putting on quite a show about now, have a couple of questions. Hi, my name is Anusha. And this is my sister, Asha. I'm all from Hallertown, Pennsylvania. And we have two questions for you. First, why do leaves use change color? Like, what happens inside the leaf? And um, how does, why do shorts and leaves change different colors in the fall? Like red and yellow and orange. Bye, we love Night, Night Me Leaves Kids Edition. Thanks girls, great question and we all love the changing leaves. So here to explain why leaves change colors in the fall is our good pal, Dr. John Torres. Reds, yellows, oranges, and sometimes even purple. As we say goodbye to the green, all these other colors start to emerge. But to understand why leaves change, we have to go back to the beginning and understand why trees even have leaves. Who better to ask than Christy Rollinson? She studies trees for a living at the Morton Arboretum Center for Tree Science. Why do trees have leaves? What do the leaves do for trees? Leaves are the powerhouse. They both make the energy and ship it off to the rest of the tree. Leaves have cells containing chlorophyll, which gives it that green color. Chlorophyll helps the leaf absorb energy from sunlight, then uses that energy to feed the tree. But in the fall, we get less sunlight and it gets colder. Those light and temperature changes make this job more difficult for the leaves. So the chlorophyll breaks down and the green disappears. The tree takes all the nutrients from the leaves to store for winter and then drops the leaves to protect itself from the cold and snow. The big thing is trees can't move, so they have to deal with winter differently than other kinds of life, things like animals or people. But did you know that leaves aren't naturally green? The chlorophyll produces that green color, and when that goes away, it reveals the natural color of the leaves, which are those yellows and oranges we see. Why are there so many colors? Because trees are awesome. If you look at different kinds of trees, if you take an oak and a maple, or even an oak and a pine, kind of like people, everybody's different and they've learned to kind of live life in their own special way. Different kind of trees have the same thing. But the red color, that's still a little mystery for scientists. The red is a bit different though. So some of the colors are always there, but just hidden by the green. But the reds are special and they're actually produced as the fall goes on to help with that process of breaking down the green. Not all trees go through these changes. Deciduous trees are the ones that have leaves that change color and fall off in autumn. However, evergreens have needle-like leaves that don't adhere to the same schedule. Why don't the needles on evergreens fall off or change color? It's a different strategy. So they actually do change color and fall off but it's not the same kind of grand display that we get from those broadleaf deciduous trees. They happen often in the spring or kind of gradually throughout the year to make room for the next wave of growth. So it happens, it just happens at a much slower pace. Depending where you live, the leaves may change at different times. Here you see the dark orange. Those places are near the end of peak fall foliage. And if you live in the south, the yellow area, the colors will reach the peak in November. Does the color of the leaves or how bright those colors are tell us anything about the health of the tree? In general, yes. So many parts of the United States, including where I am in Chicago, are having an incredibly bright fall. And that's because it's been a really great year for trees growing. Healthy trees tend to produce brighter colors. So take a walk or take a drive to enjoy the stunning colors before they disappear. 
Well, from changing colors, how about changing <laughs> looks? Dr. John is here, and uh, we have gotten into the Halloween spirit. Can I guess what you are? Go ahead. You are one smart I cookie. I am a smart cookie. Let me guess what you are. <laughs> okay. You're a press hound. I'm a press hound. I'm, I'm a news hound. That's where I got my press press badge, and I've got my trench Excellent. coat, and I'm ready to go after the news because, of course, a, a news hound is an aggressive, hard, hard-nosed journalist. So, and a nice. smart cookie, cookie knows what to do for Halloween safety, so... And you've got all the answers, and we want to talk about Halloween safety because kids need, they want to go out, they want to have fun, they want to do spooky things, but they also want to be safe, and we have a question about that. Hi, I'm Jordana. I'm seven years old, and I'm from Vermont. My question is, how do you stay safe while trick-or-treating? Thanks. I love watching Nightly News Kids Edition. Thanks, Jordana. Good question. And Dr. John, I know staying safe really starts before you leave home, before you go out trick-or-treating. Exactly. It starts now, and you want to make sure that everything's okay. So when you go out trick-or-treating, you can concentrate on filling the bucket here. And one of the first things is look at your costume. Like, you look at mine, you want to make sure it fits. It's not too baggy. It's not too long. So it's not a trip hazard. You're not tripping over it when you're going out and about. I'm from Colorado. We also have to worry about the weather, and you want to make sure people can see your costume. So if you have to wear a jacket, make sure the costume can go over your coat and your gloves if you need to so people can see it because that's important. And then masks can actually cut down on your visibility. You might not be able to see as much. And so instead of masks, think about makeup and work with your parents to make sure you get safe makeup. Try it on beforehand to make sure you're not allergic to it or it doesn't cause itchiness or redness or anything, and that way you're ready to go there. And if you do wear a mask, make sure you can see that it has some good visibility. You can see around you, and if you have a hat like you have, make sure it fits. It doesn't sag down over your eyes so you can't see where you're going. And then remember, you're going out at night when it's dark, and people in cars, people walking around might not be able to see you. So a couple things you can do. Number one, you can get a flashlight, and you can shine the flashlight around and make sure people can see you. You can get these glow sticks. These are glow sticks, which, yeah. Yeah, you and I can break these, and just boom, they break. They start shining, and Shake people can see this at night, or reflective tape. And they're kind of fun to yeah, walk around with. Yeah, these are fun right? to walk around with. Yeah. Or reflective tape. You can wear those, too, and if somebody shines a headlight from a car, they can see you just to make sure you're safe. It's so important. a lot of planning before you go out. Once you're out there trick-or-treating, what else should you keep in mind? So, again, remember, the, the main objective, of course, is to get the candy. That's yes. why you go and show yes. people your costume. <laughs> but you want to make sure. <laughs> but you want to make sure you're safe. So go with an adult or a responsible teenager, a brother or sister that your parents say, yeah, this is the person you want to go with. Go on a planned route and don't really go away from that. So if it, look on a map and say we're going down this street and then down that street, a third street, and then we're coming home. You might hear along the way somebody saying, hey, that house over there gives out great candy. Well, make sure the responsible adult or teenager is okay with you going there before you just head off and go there. Not everybody participates in Halloween, I know. Not everybody does. So if they turn their lights off, then more than likely they're not doing Halloween. So don't go up to their house, unless, of course, there's a lot of decorations, and that's why they have their light off. So respect the fact that they don't necessarily want to participate in Halloween. And then when it comes to crossing the street, you, you might see a house you want to go to. Don't just run across the street. Go down to the corner, cross at the corner or a crosswalk. Look both ways like we always talk about looking just to make sure you're safe. And then, most importantly, when you get home, you're going to have this bucket full of candy. <laughs> you want to make sure that you don't eat any of this until you get home for a couple of reasons. One, want to make sure that the candy's safe. So have your parents go through the candy with you to make sure it's safe. Number two, you don't want to eat all that candy. And it's tempting to eat it all because you'll just get a tummy ache. And then number three, as a dad, I always had my dad tax. And so when I went with them, I had my own tax, and I got part of the candy. And so I have to make sure that I get candy I like, too. So, again, help them out. Oh, really great advice. I, I bet you were one of those kids that went home and separated and, and, and did an inventory of your candy. And I tried to bargain home. with my sisters. Like, you right. don't want that one. Right, Take right. this one that I don't so like. Some seem to give you more candy than others. <laughs> Dr. John, great advice. Great costume. I'm a smart cookie. All right, I'm going to put these glasses back on. You ever seen a dog wearing glasses? Anyway, well, speaking of Halloween, we received a bunch of questions from you guys about the spooktacular day. And here now with a look at the history of Halloween is our friend Kristen Dahlgren. <laughs> Halloween is celebrated on October 31st every year. According to many scholars, the yearly tradition dates back some 2,000 years when a group of people in Europe known as Celts celebrated the end of the harvest and the start of a new year, something that Halloween expert Leslie Ballantyne has studied for years. It was on the cusp of winter, so it's looking out into the dark and dangerous season. People got together, but they also thought about what was out there in the dark. It was a very supernatural time, and 
In Ireland and Scotland, maybe 500 or so years ago, people celebrated this by coming together, having a party, playing games, building a bonfire, bobbing for apples, and trying to tell the future. And those were our very first Halloween parties. So on October 31st, people would light bonfires and wear costumes to fight off ghosts. This night was known as All Hallows' Eve, which later became more commonly known as Halloween. Halloween first became popular in the United States right around the Civil War. The first Halloween parties in America were held in the late 1800s. Then, years later, came trick-or-treating. In America, trick-or-treating came from tricks. Around Halloween time, early in the 20th century, kids would put on costumes and go out into the streets and accost people and ask them for, for sweets or for money, or they'd bang on doors and demand treats. And if they didn't get any, they would come back and sometimes mischief would ensue. Toilet paper would hang in the trees, the windows would be soaked. And over the course of a couple decades, this became the trick-or-treating we have now. Very few tricks, lots of treats. Speaking of Halloween treats, do you know what candy corn was originally called when it was first invented? Chicken feed. The candy still remains popular today. And you know those jack-o'-lanterns you see every Halloween and have fun carving? Well, years ago, experts like Leslie say they were used to scare away the evil spirits. Hi, my name is Willow. Hi, my name is Grayson. We love Nightly News Kids Edition. Our question is, are witches real? So when we ask if witches are real, I think the first thing we need to do is figure out what is a witch. And most people would agree, whether it's 300 years ago here in Salem, Massachusetts, or today, that a witch is a person that can use some magic. If somebody believes themselves to be a witch or calls themselves a witch, that's not a bad thing. People believe that magic is real and they believe as part of their practice that they can do some magic. So some of our friends in Salem who are witches will use magic, but you also have to combine that with hard work and being kind to others. And magic comes from your good thoughts and your hard work and your really good intentions. But despite the spookiness, Halloween is a date kids of all ages and many adults too look forward to every year. People still celebrate Halloween today because there is no other night like it. Uh, on Halloween, there is a certain magic that comes with the nighttime celebration of a holiday. Your neighborhood looks different. You look different. There's a freedom in wearing a costume, being out in the dark with a tail, with a cape that you just don't get on any other day. And I think people enjoy that kind of imagination. So no matter what costume you choose, let's hope the history of Halloween excites you as you look to have a beautiful time. Kristen, thanks so much for that. In keeping with the Halloween spirit, remember we told you about this teacher from Minnesota who recently broke the record for the heaviest pumpkin in the U.S.? Well, it got us to wondering just exactly how did they grow a pumpkin so big? Our friend Savannah Sellers has the story. I have the grower up on stage here with me. My name is Travis Ginger, and I grew a 2,560-pound pumpkin grown in Anoka, Minnesota. You can really watch these things grow. They grow 55 pounds a day. The pumpkin weighs 2,560 pounds. That's roughly the weight of a Mini Cooper, a saltwater crocodile, or two large grizzly bears. So how exactly do you grow a giant pumpkin? I start back in April and we just picked it in October. So it's 180 days of dedication. You're giving it little bits of water fertilizer every day, making sure it doesn't get diseased, making sure it doesn't get rotten. It's inside a little mini greenhouse for the first month. But then after that, it's exposed to hail, winds, storms, and basically the elements. If it's too cold or too hot, you got to kind of account for that and cool it down or heat it up. Giant pumpkins have to start with giant pumpkin seeds. 
This seed came from the world's heaviest pumpkin, which was grown in Italy last year. I was fortunate enough to get two seeds that grew the Guinness Book of World Records last year, 2,702 pounder in Italy. Travis plans to carve this pumpkin into a giant jack-o'-lantern, just in time for his hometown's Halloween parade. His advice for young people who are thinking about growing their own pumpkins? I would just say work hard, try and try and create your personal best every year. Sometimes you might not get it, but that's what keeps us coming back for more and more. Pretty amazing. Savannah, thanks very much. Time now for our picture of the week. The Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado just walking this new baby giraffe, and it's a girl. Zoo officials say the calf appears to be normal weight and height, close to six feet tall, almost as tall as me, and around 125 pounds, a little less than me. We're told mom and baby are doing well, and following zoo tradition, the calf will not be named until she is at least 30 days old. Finally, in our Inspiring Kids series, a 12-year-old from Maine is helping grow his family's business and hoping to inspire future farmers. Braden Nando isn't old enough to drive a car, but at 12, he's the driving force behind a successful farming business. In 2019, I started a garden, and we had a lot of vegetables piling up on the counter. So in 2020, I decided to start a vegetable stand. Me, my grandfather, and my dad built my first vegetable stand, and we figured out that that was way too small. So last year, I bought a bigger vegetable stand. Braden learned how to farm and care for animals on his grandpa's farm in Maine. I thought it was amazing. I can't get much better. I'd much rather be outside around the animals and stuff than sitting inside in front of a TV screen. Two years ago, Braden opened his very first farm stand. During the summer, he works 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But when the school year starts, Braden's grandpa pitches in. So my grandfather opens the stand for me in the morning and goes through the produce and makes sure everything's okay. He opens the stand and we have an honor box in there. So when I'm not there, people will leave the money. The seventh grader stand sells fresh vegetables along with other food, including his grandma's fresh baked bread. And of course, relish made with Braden's favorite vegetable. Zucchini, because one day it'll be three inches long and the next day it's like five feet long. I think it's really important for people to know where your food comes from and what happens. I think most kids and some adults even don't understand how that happens. I really encourage people to grow their own food and see how it all happens. Braden hopes he can educate other kids about the importance of farming. I tell them how the seeds start and how it progresses into a plant and then you harvest it and then that's something that you can eat. One day Braden dreams of opening a store, but in the meantime, he's happy helping feed his community. I really don't know anything else to do and I love it. I can't picture doing anything else. Seven days a week, um, sun up to sun down, and I'm feeding the world. Well, that's going to do it for us. We hope you learned a few things and had some fun. I certainly did. And in case you're wondering, I'll be in proper attire when I see you all on the nightly news this evening. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email the video to us at nightlynewskids at NBCUni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at Nightly Kids. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to take care of yourself and each other, and happy Halloween.